Greetings, I'm your host, Dr. Wolfula, and when I'm not not drinking wine, I'm here at Castle Wolfula reviewing movies. I'm currently on holiday away from the Wolfula at my ancestral estate in the old country. I'm relaxing in my father's old study, which my own study at the Wolfula is modeled after exactly. My folks are off at Boca Raton for the month, so I pretty much have the place to myself, and I figured since everything here is clearly 90 years behind the times anyway, I might as well make some vids about the classic classic universal monsters in what I call Juniversal Horror Month. Now, this event starts in June, but it'll probably end in July, but whatever. I couldn't resist the pun. The first review of the month is Dracula, released in 1931, directed by Todd Browning and starring Bela Lugosi, the film that really started Universal's golden age of iconic horror films from the 1930s to 1950s. Universal Studios, founded in 1912 by Carl Lemley Sr., started out with low-budget westerns and series with an annual event film to bring prestige to the company. It wasn't until Lon Chaney, known as the Man of a Thousand Faces, entered the picture that Universal began to be known increasingly for its horror films, like Phantom of the Opera. Still, horror films in America during the silent era were still restrained by a conservative approach to the genre and medium. Horror films rarely featured the supernatural, and when they did, it was usually a criminal using superstition to mask his crimes. Very Scooby-Doo back in those days. Carl Emley Sr. eventually gave his son Carl Emley Jr. full reins of the studio in 1928, and the younger Lemley pushed for an adaptation of Dracula, the horror classic about a vampire terrorizing London, written by Bram Stoker, which was also being performed as a popular Broadway play at the time. Lemley Sr. was resistant to the idea of turning Dracula into a film because of the fantastical elements of its plot that were uncommonly seen in films at the time, but Jr. got his way with Count Dracula's set to be a 500-year-old, full-blown, blood-sucking vampire from Transylvania. The only question was, who would play such a larger-than-life role? Lon Chaney was a no-brainer, but his health was failing due to cancer he would soon after die from. It was eventually decided that Bela Lugosi, a then-obscure Hungarian-born actor who played Dracula on Broadway to great acclaim, would carry on the role in film. But with great resistance from the studio and with the caveat that Lugosi take a pay cut of $500 a week. Half the salary of David Manners, who played the far less memorable role of John Harker. What a bag over the head punch in the face that is. Universal definitely got more than their money's worth with that deal, and the rest, as they say, is history. All right, let's talk about the film itself. Dracula 1931 plays out very differently from the original novel, right from the beginning. Instead of John Harker heading out to Transylvania on real estate business, Renfield, a more minor character from the book played by Dwight Fry, is chosen instead as the realtor. Little trivia, the girl who speaks the first line in the film is played by Carla Lemley, the niece of studio founder Carl Lemley Sr. Are found crumbling castles of a bygone age. I say driver, a bit slower. Renfield is intent on heading straight through the Borgo Pass to Castle Dracula, but the locals are superstitious and warn Renfield of the dangers. May people of the mountains believe at the castle there are vampires. In an early example of a tried-and-true horror cliché, though, Renfield ignores the warnings and heads to Castle Dracula anyway. What I'm trying to say is that I'm not afraid. I've got to go. Really. Meanwhile, the Count gets Renfield's Uber ready. Now, something worth mentioning is that this film, due to budgetary limitations, has no musical score beyond the Swan Lake tune used in the opening and during a play scene later. The lack of music does add an eerie quality to the film, where the silence of some scenes is only broken by faint sound effects in the distance. It is kind of creepy because there's an alien quality to watching a film without music. Music usually tips you off about what will happen in a film and tell you how to to feel, but without it, a viewer is lost. Now, if the lack of music is a deal breaker for you, most DVD and Blu-ray copies of Dracula contain an alternate track featuring a score made specially by Philip Glass in 1998. The new score is great as music, but I don't really watch the movie with it myself because it feels a little out of place and distracting in the film. It's like the music I use in my videos. While taking Renfield to the castle, Dracula gives Rudolph the Red-Nosed Reindeer a run for his money 
only by leading the carriage in bat form. Who needs a red nose to get through a foggy night when you have echolocation, bitch? Renfield arrives at the castle, and boy, what a dump. Seriously, though, this moody, decrepit, gothic interior stands as a testament to the amazing production design displayed throughout the Universal Horror catalog of films. With its imposing, eerie facades, atmospheric lighting, and attention to detail, it truly sets a tone for the films to come. The derelict castle, a dwelling of the undead, is even brimming with life, as it's home to all manner of bats, spiders, insects, possums, and armadillos. What the hell? Did they just use whatever was available at the zoo? Dracula makes his official appearance in dramatic fashion and utters his first line in that often imitated voice of his. I am Dracula. It's really good to see you. Lugosi's Dracula was a departure from the novel's version in a variety of ways, which became typical for Universal's horror adaptations. They made these iconic monsters their own. Lugosi's Dracula is a charming figure donned in a sleek cape and medallion, whose Hungarian accent possesses an inviting warmth. Listen to them. Children of the night. What music they make whose every action plays out slowly and deliberately. Lugosi's portrayal of Dracula has this intense, piercing stare and oftentimes wicked smile that is accentuated by cinematographer Carl Freund's lighting and cinematography. The Count is a monster with a lot of darkly erotic overtones that comes with the territory of a man creeping into rooms at night to draw blood from the slender necks of slumbering girls. The film was even advertised more as a romance than a horror film. This all earned Count Dracula his status as an early sex symbol of the horror genre, which is in stark contrast to the Count of Bram Stoker's novel, who was this old aristocrat type who had a large mustache and spoke in a fake British accent, which sounds like a typical unfuckable villain for the time. Bela Lugosi was anything but typical for the time, marking his subverted portrayal as an icon of horror that every version of Dracula since is measured against. Aren't you drinking? I never drink. Why? Now, despite the Universal Dracula taking the character in a different direction, the film still owes a debt to the unauthorized silent adaptation of Dracula, Nosferatu, released just nine years earlier. Despite that film featuring a Dracula in the form of Count Orlok, an iconic portrayal in his own right, who is totally the polar opposite of the Lugosi version, the Universal adaptation still drew from the 1922 film in many ways, including blatantly lifting a scene where Dracula is driven back from sucking blood by a dangling crucifix. From here, Dracula has his way with Renfield and turns the man into his faithful servant. You know, as a travel buddy during those long cruise trips. By the time the duo arrives in London, everyone aboard the ship has been killed. Kinda like that confusing ship scene from Lost World Jurassic Park. How the fuck did that T-Rex wander around the ship and kill everybody? Uh, but anyway, everyone thinks Renfield's a lunatic and Dracula makes himself at home in London. Pimp cane in hand and struts his stuff on the foggy streets, looking for some bitches to neck, literally, handing out hickeys like he's slurping up oysters. Now, films back in the day were prohibited from exhibiting profane acts. Even before the Hayes Code, things were strict, so you never actually see Dracula make contact with the neck in the film. In fact, Lugosi's Dracula doesn't even have fangs. Lugosi only played Dracula twice and never donned the chompers typical of vampires. Dracula meets up with the actual main characters of the film, Dr. Seward, who runs the insane asylum, fun guy, and the doc is joined by his daughter Mina, her fiancé John Harker, and Mina's friend Lucy. All four of these characters are boring and don't really get developed much, especially John Harker, played by David Manners. Since Renfield occupies Harker's role of meeting the Count first, it feels like John is just in this movie because he was in the book, but in this film he serves very little narrative purpose and barely registers at all. That's the sort of thing I'd expect one of the patients here to say. Like Dr. Seward is more important than this motherfucker. I'm a little more normal. Like John? Lucky that Mina is into boring dudes like John because Lucy takes a liking to the Count. Who doesn't? Love all you like. I think he's fascinating and seems keen on getting a booty call, so Drac here provides. The next day, Lucy dies on the operating table. On the throat of each victim, the same two marks. 
Professor Van Helsing, played by Edward Van Sloan, talk about typecasting, believes that there is some link between Lucy's mysterious death, Renfield devouring the life force of small animals, and the enigmatic Count that moved in down the street who talks about shit that only vampires talk about. For one who has not lived even a single lifetime, you are a wise man. Van Helsing puts his hunch to the test by seeing if Drac catches his reflection in a mirror and the Count pimp slaps the mirror out of the professor's hand, which is a reaction to a reflection that only a vampire and Clint Howard would have. Dr. Seward, my humble apology. I dislike mirrors. Now, this is a classic film with an important legacy, but I'm gonna be for real here with you folks. Once Dracula leaves Transylvania and Van Helsing figures out Drax is a vampire, there's not a whole lot of plot left in the movie for the next half hour. The story falls into this weird pattern of Van Helsing pretty much just saying, we gotta kick Dracula's ass, and Dracula's showing up to say they're not gonna kick his ass, and then Van Helsing saying, oh yes we are, bitch. What makes matters worse is that Todd Browning, the director of the film, approached the shooting of this movie too simply. Simply. Dracula 1931 is mostly just static camera angles with limited movement. It's like watching a Kevin Smith movie. The film very much plays out like a stage production, which it is an adaptation of, technically. But it's not the best example of what could be done with the then-fledgling medium of film, with certain events often just being described instead of just shown. What's that? Running across the lawn. Looks like a huge dog. The only things that really liven up Dracula are, well, Dracula, of course, and Dwight Fry having the time of his life playing the manic Renfield. <laughs> <laughs> Anytime these two are on the screen, it's magic, but there's just not enough of them on the screen, and a lot of screen time spent with these straight-laced heroes just sort of sitting around kicking ideas about how to beat Drac. Hell, I got more joy out of the brief scenes involving the quirky hospital staff over the main protagonists. They're all crazy except you and me. Sometimes I have me doubts about you. Yes. A lot more could have been done with the original Dracula, and I know that for a fact because of the technically superior Spanish version of the film that was shot at night using the same sets and costumes, but with a different cast and crew. At the time, it was common practice to shoot foreign language versions of movies, and because the Spanish version of Dracula shot after the English version, director George Melford had the benefit of seeing dailies of the English version and set out to actually outdo it at every opportunity. I like that kind of pettiness. The Spanish version version follows the same script, but it's longer, allowing for more development, and it's a far more dynamic film, featuring much more interesting takes on scenes and shots. Take, for instance, Dracula's introduction. In the English version, Dracula is just standing silent, which is great and eerie, thanks to Lugosi's performance, but in the Spanish version, Drac emerges from a casket in a puff of smoke. Another example is Renfield meeting Dracula. In the English version, Dracula just walks in, but in the Spanish version, a bat flies overhead and then, seemingly out of nowhere, Dracula appears with a tracking shot that really sells his entrance. Soy Dracula. Even simple stuff like Dracula smacking the mirror is much more intense than in the English version. Carlos Villarias is no match for Lugosi's performance, of course, especially since Villarias was told to emulate Lugosi, but other than Lugosi and Dwight Fry's performance, the Spanish Dracula is where it's at on a technical level. It's what the English version of the film should have been, and it's hard not to feel sorry for Lugosi. He put his all into having his own personal stamp on the character of Dracula, but the movie he's in is hardly a definitive version of the Bram Stoker tale. I'm gonna be spoiling the finale of the film, but I'm not gonna bother with time code shit because this movie is almost 100 years old and based on a book that's over 100 years old, so you should know this shit by now. In the end, Mina is under Drax's spellbinding power and will forever be one of his servants by sunup. To make matters worse, the Count abducts the poor girl, whisking her away to his abbey, which is quite the shithole too. Damn, Dracula, you live like this? Luckily, Renfield knows the way to Drac's pad and Van Helsing and Harker follow the spider-eating bastard. Drac himself kills Renfield with a Vulcan nerve pinch, I guess. 
The heroes arrive, and unfortunately for Dracula, whether he likes it or not, the dude has to take a nap since the sun is rising. So Van Helsing easily kills Dracula without fuss, and the trio just leaves. What an anti-climax. Yeah, that's it. That's the ending. But it's still better than the Saint Elsewhere series finale. Really? The whole show was just an autistic kid looking at a snow globe? What the hell was that? Anyway, Dracula 1931 is a classic horror movie for sure, and a very important horror film any fan of the genre worth their salt should watch. It's just not as good as it probably could have been, held up mostly by Lugosi and Dwight Fry's performances. Dracula is what kicked off the string of Universal monster films to come, and without this film, the horror movie genre would probably look very different today. The film may not have aged gracefully, but for the time, this was boundary-breaking stuff that opened the door for some great horror films. Just, if you watch this movie, try to catch the better Spanish version too. I give Dracula 1931 an English Dracula out of Spanish Dracula. Now, if you'll excuse me, I'm gonna go drink some wine. Oh, yeah, I also have a bonus commentary of Dracula up on my Patreon, so if you'd like to watch this movie with me as a companion, link in the description to support me on Patreon and hear me talk over this classic film. Who wants to eat flies? You do, ya loony. Thanks for watching. If you like this video, like it. And if you loved it, subscribe for more and click the bell icon to find out when my latest vids and streams go live. Want a double dose of Dr. Wolfula? Donate to my Patreon and you'll get bonus content for supporting the channel, including exclusive movie streams and commentaries weekly. I'd like to give a special thanks to my true Wolfulite supporters on Patreon and my channel memberships for their pledges. Their support helps keep the channel going after all these years. Thank you, guys. Alrighty, Dr. Wolfula signing out. See you all next time.